uh, Terry has done many, many things, uh, and he started the Human Computer Interaction uh, PCD, People, Computers, and Design program at Stanford. I tried to be supportive and help him as I could in that at that time. That was a lot of fun, and um, he has uh, been very active in uh, uh, civic things too, such as. Um, helping uh, with uh, computer scientists for social responsibility, but also in helping start the D School, which has been a very influential cross-disciplinary program that is revered by people all over the world and copied, and also people come to visit and find out about. But also it's been very productive for the students within it. Um, and uh, if you want to learn more about Terry, uh, some of us write thousands of papers. He writes books. So here's four books that he's written. Um, and uh, and they're, they've been very, very influential, very important books. Um, and um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn from showing you slides to showing you us. I'm going to sit with Terry, and um, he's asked that I ask him uh, that we do this in discussion instead of his normal uh, giving a talk. Terry's very, very... Uh, Great. He's a charismatic speaker, and and that that you can find uh, lots of places where he's given talks. But tonight it's going to be a discussion, so we welcome uh, questions and comments, um, and uh, hopefully not heckling. But we'll see. Um, I'm not sure if he's that controversial, or what we say is going to be that controversial. But I'm sure Bruce can be counted on to heckle, um, and um, we will decide. Um, and I want you to know to ask: uh, Do you want people to? Wait till we're done or not all the, all, yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing this and everybody online, um, and, uh, uh, you're gonna, um, Edwin Lee, uh, uh, vice chair, will be uh, noticing uh, your chats and, and raised hands and making us aware of them. And he'll try best he can to get the camera to, to, to point at people as they're asking questions. When you ask a question, if we can, we would like to give you a microphone and have you state who you are and and so everybody can know about it and probably point the camera at you. All right, so that is um, my, my little introduction. Um, and thank you for all being here. And we have uh, a lot more people online than we have in the room, by the way, just, just as you're, if you're interested. Um, and uh, some people that you uh, know are, are here. Well, all right, so before we start the discussion, aha! <laughs> I did come prepared. Oh, there we are. And how did I prepare? Well, I went to Claude. Some of you may know Claude, the AI system. And I said, Claude, I'm giving this talk to the HCI, SIGCHI. What, what did I say? So here is the beginning. I'm not going to read you the whole thing. Claude's version. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, in the field of human-computer interaction. We stand at the precipice of a new era in technology, one where the line between human and artificial intelligence is becoming increasingly blurred. As we gather here today to discuss the future of human-AI interaction, we find ourselves not just as observers, but as active participants in shaping this evolving landscape. I'll skip a little bit, but this is just the beginning. The rapid advancements in AI capabilities are not just ch changing how we interact with technology. They're fundamentally altering the very nature of that interaction. As HCI professionals, we are at the forefront of this transformation. It falls to us to ensure that AI systems become more sophisticated. Uh, skip the page. They also become more intuitive, more ethical, and more attuned to human needs and values. So let's embark on this journey together, a journey that promises to redefine not just our profession, but the very fabric of human experience in the digital age. Now, that's not my, I, I should have said try to do it my style, because that is not my style. But it's what you expect to get out of the LMM generation, right? It's full of good words and uh, not much content. <laughs> So anyway, I thought I would start with that. And I have some more quotes from, not from computers, but from other people, but I'll bring them in later. Um, you bring them in whenever you'd like. Um, and, uh, you know, it's your, it's your, it's your party. Um, and uh, I spent part of my afternoon with Stuart Card. Oh, great. And Stuart Card, who named our field um, and wrote the first book, 
um, described Terry as uh, more brilliant than anybody recognizes. And uh, it's possible that it happened because it was a seminal time in his life when he was 20-ish uh, that he ran into uh, Terry by way of um, being one of the main users of Shirley. And that, that's my point of Developers, not developers. just users. Okay. He says that you were the guy that had to d dive in when anything serious <laughs> needed to be done. But what he described, um, he said many things. But one of them was um, this idea that um, when you were um, in a program, because the program was inside the context of the language that you were talking about, it had access to, um, to it in a way that programs before it hadn't. And I found that kind of an interesting uh, statement. And I think you probably have a much better way of putting that than I just did. But do you want to say anything about that, that the perspective that Sherlu had about, about what it was talking about? Well, the, the simple version of that, and I, I, you know, in my respect, Stu, Stu was very much more into the cognitive theory side of things, because he was a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon with Newell and Simon, um, and uh, where I was at the AI lab with Binsky, which was much more engineering oriented. It wasn't trying to be cognitive science. Um, and um, what was different in some ways, not that there were that many natural language programs at all before it, because this is when computers just became usable for that. but. Um, was that it was talking about a very explicit model world, right? The blocks world, as it's called. So that when you said something or asked a question, it was grounded in its representation of that world and what it knew about it and what it could deduce about it. And I think that may be what he meant, that it was really in that world as opposed to just, well, what today's word, natural language stuff is, which is just more language. It's language about language about language. So the way he said it is, when you started talking about a, moving a block, it knew which blocks were around and knew how to how to respond to you, so you could so you could select from the blocks that existed. Yeah. So a, it had a very context, explicit con and a model. model. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that that's um, that that's that, and and um, there's there's a lot you know to be said about Sherlock. It was it was a, it was by many people thought to be. A uh, seminal thesis, um, and um, I, you know, I think of it as being a linguistics thesis. I'm not sure you do. Um, other <laughs> Let me just say, Noam Chomsky did not think it was a linguistics thesis. Yeah, I wrote, I wrote a term paper for. I took his course. I, you know, I was at MIT in the AI lab, and he was at MIT for forever um, in linguistics. And I took his course in. in something in linguistics and I wrote a term paper about what I was doing and, and stuff and I got a C which for a graduate grade is like forget it yes. and uh, he said you need to rethink the, the, the nature of language from the beginning that was his comment on my work so linguists did not think of it as linguistics yeah. or at least Chomsky linguists yeah and 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 yet um, you know, no he was at Harvard and, uh, yes doing language on Russian and so on. Yeah, he was doing the translation work. Were you involved with that? Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. And Carl Hewitt? Oh, well, so that's totally different. Ottinger was so, somebody whose name I knew. Uh, Carl was one of the key graduate students in the AI lab. And in fact, my work rested on his work. Yes. Michael Planner or Planner? Well, he did, I mean, if you want to know the truth, right? <laughs> Among friends, right? Carl Hewitt is this brilliant, but somewhat just, what's the right word? Uh, ADHD. No. Um, no. No, he died well, last year. Five, five, ten years ago. It's been a while. No, no. Just, it was just last year. year. Anyway. Um, but so he had this idea for a language called Planner, which did logical representation planning. And I said, that's exactly what I need. So can I use it? He said, well, I'm working on it. It's not quite ready. Da, 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 da. So I got together with Jerry Sussman and Gene Charniak, who were other graduate students there. And we did microplanner with the explicit idea that it was a subset of planner, but an implementable subset. Uh, so, and the authors of microplanner was was Ch Charniak, Sussman, and me. Ah, interesting. I, I did not realize it was three people. Okay, I installed a standard.
So let me just, while you're, what you said, let me just make one interesting side note. There has been a recent effort, a guy named Lyle Bigley, who's very involved with the computer science, the computer history museum. And he and a group of people he has working with him are re-implementing Sherdlu from the hardware up. So they're doing a simulation of the PDP-6, which is what we had doing, running the original MIT AI Lab ITS operating system, running the original, of course, original means reconstructed, but um, Mac Lisp, uh, is it called Mac Lisp? I don't think it was called. So anyway, the Lisp that ran on that system, uh, running the actual Sherdlu code as best they can, running microplanner. And it's an amazing process because every step along the way, things don't quite work like they used to, and you don't have good documentation, and they change. It's a thousand times faster. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I, 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 I do it with weights. Yeah. So they, they do it, and they actually have built a model CDP6 console. Um, and what's funny about it, it's, it's, it's a plastic console with all the switches and buttons, and the entire computing is done by a Raspberry Pi, which sits behind it. <laughs> right. So what was the huge AI lab, Moby, called it Moby memory, you know, all this stuff, is now being re replicated on a Raspberry Pi. It's worth for a $10 computer. Um, what did people find seminal about, about Sherman? Well, the thing that I think really struck them the most was that people had thought about computers and language in the sense of programming languages. You gave a very clear statement and the statement was executed, it ran and so on. And human language was very different because it had context. So if I said to, to go into the Sherdlu world, pick up another block and put it next to that one. Human language, we know what that means. When I said another block, it's related to some block you did before and next to that one relates to it so on. But that kind of casual context was not in computer languages at all. So the fact that it sort of put on this uh, show, let me call it that, of being able to do the kind of implicit understanding that people do was, I think, very surprising. There was a, like Bill Woods, who was at Harvard at the time, did a program on natural language for an airline, airline schedule system. So you could say things like, how many flights leave Boston that will arrive in Chicago, da, 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 da. But he didn't push on this context issue. So it seemed very dry. It seemed like an extended database. Whereas Sherdlu, partly because of the concreteness of what it was working on, and partly because of attention to context, I think was, they said, oh, I didn't know computers could do that. I mean, it just happens that, you know, the, the whole relationship between things uh, prepositions um, on, under, over, around, behind. That stuff is actually, for funny, funny reasons, is the thing that autistics can't learn. So uh, he was an anti-autistic program. Not an autistic program. Yeah, yeah. But uh, was it worth all the hype? I mean, now here we're looking at it from 2022, five um, or something. Or... Well, so if you can use the phrase all the hype, the answer has to be no. <laughs> but um, at the time, uh, I just actually was looking up, looking up quotes to, that I wanted to say something about, and I ran across one I didn't type, type it out by Herbert Simon, who was one of the founders of AI, along with John McCarthy and, and Narva Minsky and so on. And he said, and this was in 1960 something, um, I believe that within 20 years, computers will be able to think and do things, anything a person could do, a man, he said. He was pre misogynistic. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that was hype, right? I mean, 20 years passed by with almost nothing happening. Um, so the idea that, I mean, the, the metaphor, and you mentioned, Bruce, you mentioned uh, Hubert Dreyfus, who was a philosopher and a critic of, of AI. He said, you know, what's being done in AI is like climbing a tree to get to the moon. You know, you're getting higher. And you can sort of say, look how much better it was than the last year. But you're not really getting to the moon. And I think the hype was, we are getting to the moon. It's just another few steps and we'll be there. And I think that was unjustified. Clearly, it was. Right. And then there's the, the, uh, uh, the explicit representational uh, schema that people were invested in. Well, you, your, your, your stuff was. You had explicit model of, of this blocks world, which was a direction that everybody went, or many, many people went, you know, all the way to psych. And now there's this opposite paradigm, which is, 
collect all the data. Yep. And so I want, yeah, you want yeah, to no, it's, it's that. interesting. I mean, whenever people say, what do you know about what's going on in AI? My first answer nowadays is, I don't know, because it's a totally different set of principles and a totally different operating method than we had back in the days I was doing AI. So I was what, there's a guy named John Hoagland, the philosopher, I have a quote of his, but um, who, who dubbed it go, good old fashioned AI, GoFi, you'll see that acronym places. Um, and the idea was that thought was representation, that when we do things is because we have in our brain something like data structures and algorithms that operate on those data structures. And the data structures are explicitly related to the world they're talking about, like the blocks and microplanner. Um, and that you are gonna get intelligence by increasing the amount of data, amount of representation, then, because we didn't think of data the way they think of it now, and um, better logical re reasoning tools to work on it. Um, at the same time, there was an effort to do what we now think of as neural nets. I mean, the, the idea of neural nets really started at MIT with, um, I'm, yeah. blocking, I'm blocking on the names of the, uh, uh, well, Mara. David no, 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 way before, way, way before, way before, way before that. So I'm going way back. Well, Heb, um, I mean, he wrote the book. Joseph Weizenbaum. Anyway, oh, I'll no? think the name will pop out in a minute. That's the way brains work, but, um, and, there was, you mentioned Perceptron. So Perceptron was a book. The idea of Perceptron was basically a neural net learning, learning machine. Papert and Minsky. Papert and Minsky wrote a book debunking Perceptrons. What they said is single layer Perceptrons are provably incapable of doing these logical things. They were, they were right. Single layer Perceptrons were provable. Nobody could build multiple layer ones. They didn't have the amount of computation and technology to do I, it. I, I built multiple layer ones. I told Minsky about it in 1980, and he said, that won't work. That won't work? Yeah. Well, he was, yeah, I mean, I think he believed more than what they actually proved in the book. Yes. Um, but there was no way that- but I did late in learning. But uh -huh. I did late in learning with it. So. That's great. Yeah. Um, there was um, no way that you could do anything very interesting with the amount of computation that we had that people had most in there. They were right. Given the computers of the time and given the day they had and what they could do, there was no way that was gonna succeed. So when I, you mentioned earlier, well, you mentioned uh, Dreyfus, you mentioned the, the book with Flores. What we said in there is that we've become convinced that the explicit representational model of the human mind is inadequate and that a computing system based on that model is not gonna succeed at being intelligent. Um, there's a little footnote, not a footnote, but a side comment in one of the chapters, which says, now, if you look at something like neural nets, all bets are off. We have no idea what you can do with that. So the critique of AI was a critique of a symbolic representational approach to AI. And the idea of doing something that was more neural net like it just wasn't feasible. And we're talking about 20 years before there was the hardware to to actually do yeah. any of it. So you've obviated my next question, and it's a great answer that you gave, but uh, is that when you kind of decided that HCI would be kind of a more exciting direction yeah. for you? So, so, I mean, to put a little history into it, uh, when I came out here, I was at Stanford at the AI lab, and I was also consulting at Xerox Park. And what I always say about Xerox Park is, you know, Xerox Park, they invented the laser printer and the uh, bitmap bit display, display and the ethernet. I was there, but I didn't do any of that. <laughs> I was working on the natural language project. I wasn't working on all the cool stuff. Uh, I was using it. I was an early user of many of those things. Um, but it was an attempt to take the representational ideas and go farther forward with them. And what happened over time, and it's always hard to reconstruct personal history, but it just became discouraging. I mean, it did feel like we were climbing the trees. I mean, I just, we came up with something called knowledge representation language, KRL. I worked with Danny Bobro. Some of you may know him. He died a couple of years ago. Uh, very huge hero, smart guy at, at, at Xerox Park. And um, 
it just it was I didn't have the conviction that it was going to get there, that it was going to go somewhere. So then the question is, what do I do? And I could keep beating against that wall, and plenty of my colleagues did. Um, or I could say, I'm going to go learn about this neural stuff. I would, I mean, I actually talked. Maybe I should go do another PhD in neuroscience. And I said, eh, I'm too old, too well set in my way, right? I'm not, I'm not going to start all over again like that. But what if I give up on the hype, to go back to your word, that we are going to build computers that think like people, and instead ask the question, how do you build computers that are good for people to think with? Um, the distinction, if, you, if you've read the John Markoff's book between artificial intelligence and intelligence augmentation. And in fact, Doug Engelbart and his whole group at uh, SRI had what they call the augmentation research lab. And that's what actually led to all the stuff you hear about from Park. Uh, and um, so I said, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to make assumptions that I can do something that thinks like a person, but I'm really going to focus on the question of what is it that makes this computer system useful for people, makes it usable, not just useful, useful and usable. And so uh, it was about 1990, roughly. I officially, I mean, there's nothing very official because the computer science department didn't have subdivisions that you were in or out of, but I said, I'm not doing AI anymore. I'm doing HCI, which is human computer interaction. And I started the program at Stanford, um, which was not terribly appreciated. Um, there was, we had, had a retreat right around that time. And uh, at the retreat, they said, okay, let's decide where we're gonna do our faculty hiring. What are the areas of computer science that need more faculty in our department? And they put up a big list on a whiteboard and had 11 or 12 things. And I said, human computer interaction, Right. The first comment, and they opened it for discussion, was somebody who said, well, I was a CMU and I saw those guys doing human computer interaction and I think it's worthless. <laughs> right. uh, so it's not like real computer scientists thought that it was a really respectable thing to be doing. Uh, but at that point, I had 10 years, so what the hell. <laughs> yeah. So about, about that time, I went into the office of the, of the chair of the department, uh, I think it was Allman, and and I talked about HCI, and he says, we will never do HCI at Stanford. <laughs> That's what he said. Um, yeah, Ullman was one of the skeptics, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, what, I, I, what, what, what kind of a... Well, I think, I think this is a good time for us to talk about what fun did you have writing these books? Uh, can you say some of the highlights of some of the what you learned or what you unlearned or what you think was something that we probably didn't notice in one of these books. There's a pizza, you know, that's a Easter egg you just told us about, about neural nets I hadn't noticed. Uh, um, what, what do you well, to each book this? was fun in a very different way. So the first book I did was basically my dissertation, which got published in a journal and then in a book. Um, and a huge amount of fun, right? I got noticed in the world. I mean, I got out there, I gave talks. I mean, it was, it was, launching into the field of AI, and, and that was very exhilarating. Yeah. Second book I did, which I think about from time to time, was a textbook on uh, syntax, processing of syntax. And I put a lot of time into it. So why did I think you were interested in linguistics? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I would, at the time, I was actually joint in linguistics yeah, and I know. science. <laughs> um, and I see it sitting on my shelf still now and then, and it, I, I doubt it's sitting on many shelves anywhere in the world. Um, but what was really fun about it is I did all my own typesetting. Yeah. You remember I come from the same department as Don Knuth and he had developed tech and we had the XGP printer. And it was just, and I did all, I did fancy stuff where, you know, the, I made up my own symbol structures for sentences and syntax and stuff. And then got it all to print out. And I, mean, I remember going down to the bottom basement there in Market Jacks by then is where we were. Um, and, you know, waiting for the machine to put out these pages and so on. It was, it was very different from what you do in a laser printer today. I mean, same in principle, but <laughs> operationally different. Paper uh, tapes were involved. No, not quite. But Well, but they were when I was doing it. So that was, that was a lot of fun in a way which is sort of orthogonal to the content. 
It's about the process and about the, the, the mechanism. Mm -hmm. And then the third one, uh, which is called bringing design to software, was fun in a totally different way, which is I said, okay, what is design? And what relationship does it have to programming? And I've been talking, some of you may know Mitch Kapor. He was the original creator of Lotus 1, 2, 3, um, and did a lot of, and he always used to say, I'm not a programmer, I'm a software architect. What he meant, he, he had this analogy, which I thought was great, which is you're building a building. You can go to an engineer who will tell you about structures and beams and all that kind of stuff. But if you go to a good architect, and some architects are not <laughs> good in the sense, but they're not going to start off with that. They're going to say, what do you want to do here? How do you want to live? What's this place going to, what's this environment going to be for the people who live in it? And he said, that's the kind of software architect I am. I'm looking at the environment that people are going to live in. I'm not looking at how the beams are put together. Somebody else can do that. I'll hire somebody to take care of that. Um, so I thought that was a really good insight. And I said, there are a bunch of professions called design in different fields that do this. So I brought together a conference. I remember we were at, um, what's the name of that resort out on the coast by Santa oh. Cruz? No, no, uh, uh, Silomar. No, no, it wasn't the Silomar, but it was um, somewhere. Oh, Pajara Dunes. Pajara Dunes. And uh, we got a dozen people or so, one of whom was a type designer, one of whom was an urban designer, one of whom was a mechanical designer, one of whom was, and so on and so on, where all, what they had in common was thinking about the design of things, but what they had different was what kind of thing they were designing. And, uh, and Kapoor, who was thinking about software and, and so on. Um, and then the book ended up being a collection of essays. I helped them write and edit the essays. So it wasn't really a book by me, it was a book uh, facilitated by me, but it was, uh, so the, the, the fun there was all in the people and the, the process and so on. And then the last one. Um, just, just to give you an idea of how Terry, in my mind, is like that, is that for 25 years, he would sit in the front row every week and have somebody and celebrate somebody else's work talking about an uh, HCI from a different point of view. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. <laughs> yeah, that was so, the tagline. And, and also in his office with his students, there was also a celebration of other people's points of view and, and, and work as well. So, so that, that's just an aside. Let me come back to that design book in a minute. But first, I want to do the, the, the fourth book, which was a really amazing process and learning experience for me because I did it jointly with Fernando Flores. and. If you'll indulge me, I will take a two minute version of his life history, which is pretty incredible. He's from Chile. He was an engineering student at the University of the Catolica in, in Santiago. Um, and it was the, the late sixties when there were student revolts happening all around the world. Some of you are old enough to remember that, right? Um, and Chile was included and Due to some sequence of events, the details of which I actually don't know, he became effectively the provost of the university without having a degree and being 24 years old. <laughs> he was just, he's a brilliant guy. I mean, I always describe him as somebody who can read four big books before breakfast. I mean, he's just a voracious mind. So anyway, uh, and he was very active in the political party of Salvador Allende, who was the elected socialist leader of Chile. Um, he, within a very short period, moved uh, after Allende came to power from being the vice president of the state-owned organizations to the president of the state-owned organizations, to the minister of finance, to the minister of economics. And evidently he was about to become minister of defense, but that was close to the time that Pinochet uh, carried off his coup. This is all set in 1976, to be precise. Um, and through uh, 73, 73, 73. Um, and bombed the Moneda, which was the presidential palace, uh, killed Allende. Fernando actually had an office in the front of the building, which was bombed, but he wasn't in the office at the time. And he spent three years as a political prisoner uh, in a sort of bleak island off the south coast of Chile. 
and you know, South Coast is not the warm part of Chile. <laughs> um, so um, during the time he was in prison, he was evidently treated relatively well because he was not somebody who had a, a um, following. Like one of his cellmates there was the head of the Communist Party in Chile. And they were worried, what would he do, right? Fernando was a whiz kid. He was where he was because he was really smart and working for somebody. And when the somebody he was working for was gone, he was still really smart, but he didn't have any power. Um, so he was allowed to have some visitors and to do some reading. And he read a lot of philosophy and management stuff. And um, the San Francisco chapter of Amnesty International, I don't know if you know them, it's an organization that takes on prisoners, political prisoners around the world. And the way they worked at that time, at least, was a local chapter would take a particular prisoner in some country and advocate and send letters to the State Department. They would do all sorts of stuff to try to get them out. It turned out the San Francisco chapter had two people who were in the computer science department at Stanford, um, uh, whose name I'll also remember in a minute, Bob Floyd and um, uh, George Danzig. And so one of the conditions that the Chileans put on his release was that he have a job already waiting for him out of the country. He said, we're not worried about this guy, but get him out of here. Right? So they, and this is an era when a little more flexible on hiring research associates and stuff. <laughs> um, they hired him as a research associate. We didn't pay them anything. <laughs> I don't know. You think he got paid? And I don't know. That I don't know. Anyway, so he was literally in prison on this island off of Chile. And the next day he was at Stanford. They brought his family to the airport. What? 36 hours. 36 hours. They brought his family to the airport and they shipped him to California and he and the, the Amnesty International chapter brought him to Stanford. So um, I got to know him somewhat after that. There's another story, but I'm not going to go into it. Um, and we started just having conversations. Uh, one thing, when he came, the first time he came into my office, at that time now it was Polio Hall, not Margaret Jackson. You know, and he looked on the wall and I had a Chilean... Uh, leftist musical group poster, Inti Leimani, it's the name of the group. And he looked at that, and here's this computer science guy at Stanford, right? He said, I knew I was okay. <laughs> so over the course of, well, ever since then, so we're talking 20, 30 years, but particularly between then and the time this book came out in 86, um, we just had a mutual education society. I mean, I was teaching him about computers and about artificial intelligence, and he was teaching me about philosophy and about uh, politics and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and he ended up at Berkeley uh, and ended up doing his PhD thesis there with Dreyfus and John Searle. Um, oh, no, it wasn't. It was Dreyfus's brother. Hubert wasn't actually the advisor, but he was very involved. Um, and... Um, I, you know, it's, it's one of those, again, it's hard to reconstruct your own intellectual history, but that was a big part of my saying, I don't think the AI I've been doing is going to work. This is the eighties, right? And I said, I switched in 90. So this was the process, the process of moving outside of the representational and, and the philosophy part of it was what's called phenomenology, uh, number of, of uh, people, including Heidegger, which is another complicated story. But, um, and the basic philosophical stance is that we do not relate to the world by having representations and symbols, that we relate to the world by, to use the jargon, thrownness, um, and that we're in the world and doing things in the world and reacting in the world. And then when we stop to think about it, we put it into articulated thought. But that's when we stop to think about it, when it becomes, again, to use the jargon, present at hand instead of ready to hand. Um, and there's, I mean, as you know, in academic philosophy, there are millions of books written from every angle on this kind of stuff. Um, but from the point of view of AI, what I was saying is the kind of representational view we were doing wasn't close to what people were actually doing. It was close to what people thought when they were thinking about what they were doing, but not to what they were actually doing. Um, and that was part of my influence in getting out of the uh, 
AI uh, style that I was in. Bayesian statistics uh, an issue for you ever? No, no, statistics were not an issue at all. I mean, it was like a more of it against uh, McCarthy with respect to Bayesian. Well, perspective. if we go back to this representation question, you're you're really sitting in this world where you're starting to think of representing knowledge and and logical thought as quite disjoined from the act activity of living and the interactions that are meaningful to people. Is there anything more you want to say about that? That's, that's kind of, I think that, that book really, you know, struck a chord in, in a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, I think it struck a chord. And again, you, like you say, what about the hype? What, what are people like, like? But I think that it moved away from the sort of taken for granted assumption that if we could only figure out how the thoughts were all represented, we'd have everything. And it said, you don't have to worry about that. That's not how it all works. Um, now, how, how does it all work is another question. <laughs> What's it all about? Yeah. Um, so we could move through more of that. Um, but I guess I wanted to take a break and say, what fun did you have working at all these? You, you worked at Park. You worked at Atari. No. You worked at Paris. Uh, not Atari. I saw you at Atari. I, vi I visited. Okay. <laughs> but I, no, I never worked okay. there. Google. Uh, so, Others. yeah, so I, I was lucky enough and being at Stanford during the time all these things were happening, right? Um, when I, as I said, when I first came out here, I was at Park and I maintained that connection for <coughs> a decade or so. Um, and um, there's a lot of really brilliant people there doing innovative work. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to give the litany of things that Park developed. You, you all know it if you're an HCI. Um, and, um, then I, it's always hard to put these into order, but let me just pick a different one. There was a guy named Dave Liddell who was at Xerox. He was not in park. He was in a different division that was trying to commercialize all that stuff that the lab was doing. So park was the lab and he was in the commercialization part of it. Um, and he left there and went to IBM and, as he said, I, I served time as a vice president at IBM. Um, and um, then he just, he got together with Paul Allen, who you've probably heard of. And Paul basically said, look, I've got plenty of money. And Park did all these wonderful things that really created the next generation of computing. So I want to do the next one. I want to be the one who brings together the smart people in the lab and does the next generation of computing. So he got Dave Liddell to be the president and they created something called Interval Research, um, which was in Palo Alto and uh, brought in a lot of really interesting, smart people uh, again. So, but that's, that's what's great about being in all these places is the people. Um, it was an interesting question as to why it didn't succeed. Um, one is you can't make lightning strike twice, right? I mean. It did some interesting stuff, but you can't say it's going to be as big and as great as the other thing. But the other is the timing was just off, which is it started up with a very big emphasis on like physical computing, and devices, and all sorts of stuff like that, just before the web got big. And all of a sudden, all of the money and all of the energy and all of that was in the web, uh, the internet. So... Some of the things which could have potentially Cameron gone farther Jordan. just got choked out by everybody running off to do the web. So anyway, but again, that was a really fun place to, um, I'll tell you, going back to Atari, Brenda Laurel was one of the people who I helped hire for that. Yes, I remember her. Um, and, and Eric Altine. And what? Uh, her her ex-husband, Eric. Yeah, ex -husband. yeah, right. It was at interval that, that she switched. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in the meeting where she presented the concept of, of, uh, of her interest in this particular person. So yeah. and uh, Joy Mountford, and uh, there's a lot of um, exciting people, exciting people there. And then Google. So I had, I was part of the um, project was called the Digital Libraries Project. And this was a multi-university, multi-sponsor program back in the, 90s. Yes, I could, I could pin down the dates, but I'm not good at that. 
Um, and the idea was, if you looked around the web, around the internet, wasn't the web yet, there were silos of information. There was le legal information in Lexis, there was medical information in whatever it was called. And to get into those silos and pull out the information, you had to know the arcane spe specifics of each one of them. And so the idea, they said, is what, what if you could have some uniform way to access these different silos of information in a way that people could understand and master and so on, and think of the whole set of stuff that's out there as the digital library. Now, and so there was a project at Berkeley, at Stanford, at CMU, a bunch of places. And what was interesting, again, in terms of timing, is that this was just pre the takeoff of the web. So when you said, what does it mean to have information on the internet? You didn't think about what we think about today. You think about these carefully curated, siloed information sources, data sources. Um, and that was the direction we were going. And then, of course, being at a place like Stanford, you get smart graduate students coming in. And Larry and Sergey became part of the project. I, I was officially Larry's advisor. Um, yeah, well, not yet. <laughs> um, okay. And they said, well, there's all this stuff now that's appearing randomly on the web. Uh, why don't we find a way to f have uniform access to that instead of these fancy dancy databases? Um, and they said, why don't we just, uh, again, I could spend an hour on the history of how Google developed, but they basically said, why don't we have a way of indexing everything on the web. And my first reaction was, you mean everything on the web? That's like tens of thousands of things, <laughs> right? Uh, they said, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, it's only this many DLT tapes. Yeah, right. Yeah. So they started the project to index everything on the web. Um, and it was, it was fun. I mean, it was, they were doing it out of Stanford originally and we got into, I mean, I remember mean, this one whole hassle with this, with the legal office being called in because there was this guy who had some website that he had put up with his artistic endeavors, um, some other country, it wasn't even in the US, and they were crawling it. And he said, You're stealing my art. And they said, No, no, we're not stealing it, we're just indexing it. Does this sound familiar in today's AI world? <laughs> what constitutes indexing and stealing is it? Be stayed a big question. But anyway, um, and he said, I'm going to sue you. And we had to bring in the university lawyers. And it was, so there it was lots of different things going on. But ultimately, they said, well, the, the first thing that happened is they were not the first search engine, right? I was already using Alta Vista, and people were using Lycos and Dahl. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were a handful of different search yeah, engines. Yeah. Um, they were in the same group. Yeah, I don't remember what lady have a search engine. System thirty three, et cetera. Okay. Yeah. Larry was just in for Seek and Yahoo, and so yeah, anyway, yeah. It doesn't right, they all had it. But anyway, what happened to me and everybody else is you, you know, you a lot of these other engines, you would say, okay, I'm interested in this thing. And two problems. Problem one is you would say, okay, let me look up this thing I'm interested in. I'll get a cup of coffee and come back and see if it's found anything. As they're slow. And the other is what it did find was random junk because it was the, whatever anybody is talking about, we had this big complaint from this guy who was a scholar of Abraham Lincoln. And he said, I did a search and I came up with these stupid term papers and stuff that people, kids have been put on the net about Abraham Lincoln and I'm the expert. How, I'm sorry. <laughs> how, how, how can they not recognize that I'm the expert? Um, so, um, that's where PageRank came in, and they said, we're going to not rate people, not rate pages by how much internal coherence there is, but by how much external validation there is. That was the insight. Um, and then it got too big, and they went off to the garage. And, uh, the well, they were in the basement. No, I don't think they were in what the basement. The Second floor. floor. No, that was the, the, there was a display case in the basement, but I think the actual thing that down there was in their office upstairs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Too hot. Um, but well, it was where they had. Anyway, um, no, they went, I mean, sort of sad to recognize. They went off to the garage owned by Susan Owick, uh, Wojcicki, who just died, uh, unfortunately young, uh, a little while ago. Um, 
And then, so I said to, Ted mentioned that I had these weekly seminars. And I said to Larry, you know, come give a seminar on what you guys are doing at Google. So he came and gave a talk on their, their attitude towards human computer interaction, which included really good stuff. Like you can't make people wait. <laughs> that matters. It's not just a coincidence. You have to pay attention. Anyway, um, so after the talk, I said, you know, Larry, you've got a lot of really good experience doing this. And I've got a lot of theoretical background from being a professor. Why don't we write a book together? And he said, oh, that'd be fun. So why don't you come to Google for a year and we'll write the book? I said, sure. Because I, I was, you know, we get sabbaticals every now and then. That's part of being a professor. So I planned on my sabbatical to go work on a book together at Google. I got to Google and he said, oh, my God, I'm way too busy to do a book. But why don't you just stay here and work, help people, you know, do stuff here. So I ended up spending a year plus a summer um, as an employee at Google. Uh, back when the entire company got together in one room for the TGIF event. Um, so it was one building, right? I mean, this is when it was just, it was already in uh, Mountain View. This is after it moved out of the office and University Avenue, but it was still- San Antonio Road. Uh, it wasn't San Antonio, it was- Building 43, right? Yeah, well, it was a Silicon called, Graphics building yet? No, 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 no. They didn't have no, that for a long time later. It was, oh, is that one story building where the, the cap, uh, It was a one story building. Yeah. They had a building. <laughs> this is Google, right? So they were building zero, of course, because you'll start indexing at zero and building one. And there was building pi. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Um, so it was great. I mean, I got to really know what I was doing. I worked, what I worked on there was, a, well, two main things. One was I was on the team that was doing Gmail, which at the time was called Caribou. Um, and the other is I talked to uh, Rosenberg, who was the head of product. And he said, you know, we have this system for associate product managers. Associate product, I and mean, they were really pioneers in, in using this process. Associate product manager was a young person, typically just out of master's, not even a PhD, um, who was in charge of coordinating across the different dimensions of a product. So they had to think about the user interface, they had to think about the technology for building it, they had to think about the marketing. They were pulling that together and that was what was brilliant about it is that you had one person who really wasn't in one of those silos, silos here. Um, and he said, we've got these young guys, they're really smart, they do a good job, but they need some mentoring, some help with what they're doing. And I said, oh, you mean like graduate students? <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up having a handful of graduate students, so-called, I mean, they were not sufficiently students, but at, at Xerox, for, at, at, not Xerox, at Google for a year. So Google was a really good experience in that way. Yeah. So um, uh, because of what you just said, I want to move on to um, tell us some stories about some of your favorite experiences as a, with, with graduate students, what, what did you see them accomplish? How did you work with them? What were some of the, one of the, some of the fun, fun things that you felt? So besides Larry and Sergey, which you've gone into. into some... um, I had a certain approach to it, which was not the same as all my colleagues, um, which is there are some faculty who say, I know what I want to do. I have a vision. I'm going to get in graduate students to help me carry out my vision. Um, and that's great. I mean, I'm, I probably would have gotten more done in my life if I had taken that attitude. Um, but I tended to be more uh, parental, right? You, you have a young person and you want them to develop in the way they're going to develop and you want to support them and help them with it. So I had graduate students doing randomly different projects. I had one who did um, using eye tracking. So you could control the, the interaction by eye motions. Uh, he ended up going off and becoming a venture capitalist, right? <laughs> um, I had uh, one, I'm trying to think, I had a couple, but I had three or four who were doing things around the Digital Libraries Project, which included Larry and Sergey, but included some other people. Um, Michelle. Michelle Baldonado, yeah, who you know. 
Um, I had one sort of end up with a very interesting trajectory, Martin Rocheisen is his name, and his thesis was about, um, was, he called them compacts, and I forgot now what it stood for, but it was having explicit um, commitments between programs, the details of which I've now long forgotten. But he, after graduating with that, went off and started a company to do what he called nano solar, which was a way of printing solar panels on reels of plastic instead of on hard chips. In an unrelated story. What? In an unrelated story to his, to his totally, thesis topic. Totally unrelated. Topic. <laughs> and then he, after he, he developed the nano solar thing, which was somewhat successful, but the, the whole solar industry got complicated. Uh, he created a new company called the Diamond Foundry, uh, which was here in South San Francisco, which lays down, it uses vapor, a plasma deposition to create diamonds. So you've got these huge chambers that are reacting whatever carbon and stuff, and it lays down diamonds layer by layer. And there were, they were trying to compete with natural diamonds for jewelry because um, they they could compete on a cost basis. The problem is jewelry, people have funny feelings about if it's artificial and, and so on. And their current thing, which is what he's doing is uh, diamond substrates for chips instead of silicon substrates. Now, how that came out of my PhD advising, I have no idea, but interesting batch of but, stuff. But there was something you talked about along the way, which was promises. And Stu this afternoon said there was a very important topic around promises and social commitment that you got involved with. And he said you made a company around, around uh, social um, commitments. Yeah, that's another interesting side story. So again, it goes back to my friend Fernando Flores, who just today he sent a message saying, can you talk tomorrow? Uh, I happen to be busy, but uh, we're still in touch. Um, his theory of language and management was built around the notion of commitment. That you could say things, and there are a lot of different ways you use language, but that the key to effective language was knowing whether somebody was actually committing to something, and if so, whether it was being carried out, and so on. And um, he has done for many years now workshops, management workshops, basically about this, very successfully. But he said, couldn't we have a commitment machine? Couldn't there be a way that what when people communicate online they're and remember now we're talking about 1990 right before everybody was doing text messaging and stuff um and so he came up with this, this idea a program called the coordinator um company called action technologies and the idea was and as a business it was oriented toward businesses not towards private. And um, when I sent you a message, I did not send you just a message. I sent you a request or a promise. And if you replied to my message, you didn't just say in text, yes or no, you clicked the button which said accept or decline or modify. So you made very explicit in the communication structure um, the things which he said were underlying. I mean, those are all there when I just say to you, hey, you want to come to my house tomorrow? And you say, sure. I mean, that's a request and a commitment. But it's a vague commitment, right? And especially if you don't specify times and dates and so on. So this company called Action Technologies built this thing that was somewhat successful. Um, some people resisted it very strongly, saying it makes me feel like everything I, every time I talk to somebody, it's a legal contract. Um, it was most successful, for example, they had a big successful deployment with the, the film company that did film work in the field in Africa because they needed some kind of very, you know, if you're going to show up tomorrow with the film, it's got to be there. It's not like you can say, oh, I'll get it to you when I can. All right. And, and so, so Stuart. Yeah. So, yeah, not exactly the same flavor, but it's in that same world. So Stuart, but, Stuart said some very interesting things about this to me, which is he said, you know, lots of customers, happy customers, but actually people don't think that way. 
and commitments have to be more fluid than that, and that that was one of the dangers of that approach. What do so you think of this that? was, I mean, uh, I don't know how many of you heard of Lucy Suchman. She was at Park back in those days at Park. She was an anthropology PhD student from Berkeley who was doing an anthropology study of, of copier repair people, actually what she was and doing. things like CoLab also. And CoLab and stuff. Anyway, um, she wrote this highly critical review about the coordinator, basically saying that, that um, people don't like being boxed in by explicitness. In fact, and she, she had a very strong sort of labor point of view, which was, Vagueness is a worker's tool for avoiding being dominated by the bosses. That being made to be precise actually gave the boss too much power. Um, so there were a lot of complications. And I mean, it's clear we had, we had stories of programmers who are not the most well-behaved of employees um, throwing the disc. And in those days, it was on a floppy disc, right? over the wall of their cubby saying, I'm not going to use this stuff, right? Because uh, they were so annoyed at having to be explicit about things. Um, so it, it was a very interesting, there's a whole literature uh, about the pros and cons of doing this. Um, so that was important. No, that, that's great. That's great. Um, and um, I want, uh, you know, you worked really hard to build the D school. I mean, I, I, I watched that. A little bit from the side. Um, do you want to say something about the D school? What you, what, what was your role? How did you feel about it? Why did you engage in that? And, and what do you think about what it accomplished or didn't accomplish? Sure. Uh, you know, shallowness um, or depth or whatever you want to say. Um, so let me go back a little before that, which is, as I said, in the early '90s, I got into human computer interaction, and of course, there were no courses. Right? I mean, I was going into a new area. And so the question is, what kind of courses do you teach? And you can teach the history course. You can do the Ben Schneiderman kind of course, you know, his textbooks, which say this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and this happened. And, um, but to really teach somebody to do HCI, they need practice. They need to be doing projects. So from the beginning, really, the curriculum that I did in HCI was oriented around project courses. Uh, not around lectures. I did lectures. I mean, do my share of lectures, but um, really about getting people engaged and then coaching because it's not just you say, go do a project and come back, right? You say, well, did you think about this and how do you do that and, and so on? So it was a lot more in the mold of coaching than lecturing. Um, and so I was already doing that. And then um, Going back to Joy, Joy Mountford, who I mentioned earlier, was had a program at Apple, which was trying to bring design thinking to people around the world. So she would, well, Apple would, but she was leading it, pro provide computers and a certain amount of coaching to schools anywhere in the world that wanted to create a multidisciplinary human computer interaction course. So multidisciplinary said you had to have people from at least two different departments. Uh, and it was had to be project oriented and all that. So we didn't need the coaching in the same way, but we said, well, it'd be interesting to do one of that at Stanford. And I got together with David Kelly, who was also in the design book. He was the mechanical engineer in the design book. Um, and we started teaching a course together for several years, which was a mixture of computing and mechanical. Uh, he, was in, he was in the mechanical engineering department and the social sciences. We actually required every team have at least one person from each of those three. Um, and there was a project and at the end of the quarter, you did a show, you showed your projects and, and all. Nowadays, it's not, I, I say that every single course, that's how you teach HCI. It was a little more radical in those days. Um, and having done that for a while, um, he was on his own, but with other influences thinking about doing the D school, which was a whole program based on the same philosophy of learning by doing, and learning by design. Um, so he and I and three or four other faculty sort of said, why don't we call ourselves, a, well, what's funny is it, call our, we said, we'll call it the D school. He went to the Dean 
And the dean said, no, 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 you can't call it a school. You know what it, we charge somebody to name a school? <laughs> um, Stanford has seven schools, right? And we just, they just added one since then, which is the John Doerr Environmental School. He definitely got charged for that. Um, <laughs> so um, it was always informally called the D School. Kelly insisted on calling it D School, but it was never formally in Stanford structure, a school. It was a institute. He got some money. He got a lot of funding for it from a guy SAP. named Hasso Plotner. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who was the founder, one of the founders of SAP software? Uh, but it wasn't SAP that sponsored it, it was him personally. And then he created the Hasso Plattner Institute in Germany and, and so on. Um, and David did bring in a lot of money. I, you, you probably were part, I mean, in spite of what they wanted for a school, you know, I oh, think yeah, he, he brought in 30 uh, million bucks, right? Yeah, but that's not enough for school. But yes, <laughs> <laughs> he brought in a lot of money, enough to, well, Again, if you know university politics, he brought in enough money to rehab a building. And buildings are where it's at. Right. So, so that, anyway. that's, that's kind of great. Um, we're, we're kind of, I know I'm going to wear you out if I keep asking I keep these going, questions. But, um, take everybody else uh, yeah, there's, there's a few questions online. But, but before I get to them, I guess, um, is, user, is user experience done? So you asked me that question. You know, you sent me a little, yeah, yeah, here's yeah. question I asked. And I thought, well, that's Maybe only if users are done. I mean, <laughs> user, as long as there's users, there's user experience. And those experiences change. I mean, if you mean does using a mouse and pointing at thing, is that done? Maybe. I mean, you know, a lot of th things go away. But the, f the focus, the design focus of thinking about the user experience, I mean, it's where we're at. It's not, not going to change. Right. And, and, and I guess, you know, I, I think... Um, Maybe, maybe the, you know, we used to think in terms of uh, egocentric, you know, we're the, the computer and us and that's it. And how has that changed? What okay, so that, that's a very interesting question, um, which shows my having retired and aged out of the community in some sense, which is most of the time during my life, in my academic life, um, it was what you say. There's a computer, there's a person, what goes on between them? Um, and I, my big job is to get people not to think about it as interface, but interaction. It's not the interface. It's what's going on. Right? But, um, and in the past 10 years or so, I, I don't know the exact timing because I stopped going to the CHI conferences, but if you look at the, what's being presented, you really see the shift. It's not about a person, a computer. It's about people and other people using computers among them. Social networking being the big obvious elephant in the room, but um, the whole na no the notion that what the computer is doing is mediating between people. And you want to understand the nature of that mediation and design the nature of that mediation uh, rather than just me and my computer. And I think it's really taken a big Maybe shift in that direction. Even. Hopefully yeah. supporting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, not that, that that wasn't there many years ago, but it really, if you look at, say, the conference proceedings, it's just shifted tremendously. So people matter, which is how we all got into this, I think. Um, and when people matter, sometimes you want to do things to help society. And I know you spend a lot of time and energy worrying about society. I mean, even the interaction with Fernando Flores had a little bit of a flavor of that. But do you want to say anything more about other, other civic things that you did? So... <laughs> This could be the start of the talk I would, thought I was going to give. <laughs> would take the next two hours, but I won't do that. Um, yeah, well, I'll be asleep. Um, one of the things I did, and this is back in the 80s, was one, I was one of the founders of something called Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility. And the, the tagline on the bumper sticker was, technology is driving the future. Who's steering? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And... It was a basic idea that you, know, you could see that there were things that were going to happen technologically, but who was actually going to make them go in a direction that was good for people and you wanted to go? And at the time, the main concern was military applications and the chance that they would start inadvertent nuclear wars. I mean, there was a whole set of issues that we were dealing with. But the basic idea is still the same, which is if you're going to have um, technology developing and changing the world that you live in, who is responsible 
and how do they exercise that responsibility for seeing what way it's going to go? And um, I think we're seeing that now with AI. I mean, to, to put it back into the context of AI, um, that there's a whole lot of discussion about things like, quote, alignment, and a lot of terms people will come up with, but the really hard question is, who, first of all, is going to figure out what it is they should, it should and shouldn't do? And second, who's going to enforce that? I mean, we're in a multipolar world where you have countries, you have big companies, you have uh, regulatory agencies, uh, all sorts of things, and they aren't working in accord with each other, right? They all have their own motivations. They all have their own things they want to do. And um, I don't, I mean, I'll, I'll just say it straight, I don't have any clear idea of how that's going to work out. I mean, how we're going to, given the complexities of who has the power to make decisions, how we're going to in any way shape them to be um, what we want. I will read one quote. As I said, I, I had, my quotes are along the line. And then, and, then, and then we're going to slowly transition. There's some questions that relate to some things you just said. Okay. And then there'll great. be some questions in the room that aren't Bruce. But Bruce will probably ask a question right. too. No, that's fine. This is from my present friend, Brian Cantwell Smith, who was actually a student at MIT when I was, when, when I was in the AI lab. And he wrote a book called uh, The Promise of Artificial Intelligence, Reckoning and Judgment which actually echoes a book by Weizenbaum earlier on. He says, and this is just a, out of the middle, I'm not worried, at least here, about whether AI systems will grow more powerful than we humans or that they will develop their own consciousness. Two things do terrify me, though. One is that we will rely on reckoning systems in situations that require genuine judgment. And two, that by being unduly impressed by reckoning prowess, we will shift our expectations on human mental activity. So it's not so much that they're going to take over. I mean, they won't have, we, we have the choice on that in some sense, whoever we is, and I'm back to that hard question, who's we? Um, but there is this shift where you begin to depend on them for things that they really can't be depended on. And then who's, who's responsible for that? Is it, and how do you, exercise that responsibility. I mean, but that really makes you think of is, you know, I love the way that was said, because I think we, we say, oh, we, we want the best thing to make the judgment. And if the computer's better at judging, let it do it. But maybe the fact is that whether it's better or not is a difficult thing to judge, because if we are the recipient and the requester, maybe our judgment is, is more valid than, than, than delegating it yeah. regardless. Exactly. Let me, let me, I won't quote directly, but there's a guy named John Hoagland who was a student of Dreyfus, philosopher. And he wrote this paper, which became very famous. There's a whole book about it and stuff. He unfortunately died young. But um, he said, the problem with computers is they don't give a damn. <laughs> and that's where you get to this judgment question. I mean, the computer, the LMM does not care what it, what it puts in this document. As it, there's no notion about what it would mean for it to care. There's no care there. There's no responsibility. There's no underlying concern. It's just a process that cranks out stuff. And the problem with that is you get what you put in, right? I mean, you don't, you can't uh, count on it. Of course, you can't count on people. I mean, people <laughs> can do all sorts of horrible things, but at least you have a sense that they have responsibility for caring about what they do. Uh, unless they're a complete narcissist, which we won't talk about. But yeah. So one of the questions that came very early in your talk uh, from Chris Ha is, what are some thoughts on perplexity and how hyperlinks and sources of attributions can make LLM easier to use um, as opposed to searching a search bar command type of interface like, uh, like uh, Cleverbot? The, the main thing is perplexity has this idea of attribution for, for things that it says. Yeah, I mean, attribution, you can get off into whole philosophy and language about this. I mean, what is attribution? It means you take for authority somebody else you can point to, right? So if I attribute this to the New York Times, do you believe in New York Times or not? Well, that, that we can argue about that, right? But at least that's a social decision to make. Uh, if I attribute it to some LLM, 
you don't know where it came from. It just came from some, it came, it popped out of the processing. Um, so att yeah. attribution, real attribution is hard to, well, nobody trusts anything anymore, right? Yeah. So how do you have real attribution when there's not a bedrock of trust somewhere? So a very different question that, that came up. I'm just starting to go through questions yeah. and I hope to share it with all you guys have been very patient and great audience. Um, Jeffrey Perone asks, uh, I'm starting an organization called Financial Professionals for Social Responsibility ah, cool. to support people that are concerned with bank and insurance companies. I don't know why they exist. Uh, supporting thank fossil fuel you. projects. What okay. advice do you have to offer based on your experience with computer professionals for social responsibility? I mean, I'll tell you one thing from the experience, which may or may not be applicable, which is we had a very real threat and fear. So at the time that we created that, there was genuine possibility that computer systems were going to be put into use in a way which accidentally caused nuclear war. <coughs> and that's a pretty big threat. <laughs> and it's something which you really want to stop. Now, the problem with climate is is not something as drastic and immediate as nuclear war, right? Yes, we're ruining the planet slowly over time. And uh, how do you get get the passion, get the, the, the focus on something that doesn't have that immediate I have passion for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question from, uh, from Chris Ha was um, on uh, <laughs> um, skeuomorphic realistic interfaces versus um, flat, flat uh, interfaces. Um, and I don't know, I mean, we can go into that. What's the, what's the question? Yeah, yeah, do you right. need a context uh, or something? Do you need context? Uh, there you go. Um, so, oh, is he speaking? Yeah, yeah. Do you need context or something? Um, you could yes. Um, so, no. yeah, I think for context, it's just kind of the... Go ahead. Wait, wait, wait. Can I, can I continue? Is everything fine? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So, so, so um, yeah, I, I just wanted to see what exactly, you know was kind of the difference in terms of design paradigm because I've noticed, you know, uh, there's been a design paradigm shift, you know, from, you know, more skeuomorphic, you know, Steve Jobs, GUI. Oh, yeah, we're trying to make everything similar to an office desk and make everything really like the desktop type of thing um, to, you know, a more flat design, a more bubbly design of, oh, yeah, we're going to go and um, yes. abstract everything out from the real world. Um so I guess, you know, what are your thoughts on kind of that shift? Do you think it makes no, computers yes. more or less useful? Uh, yes. So the question is, um, it's sort of a cla the classic question around classic, or sorry, skeuomorphic and then flat design is, what do you think of that shift? What do you think of that shift? And what do you think are the factors that contributed to it? Which shift? From... Uh, the trade-offs between skeuomorphic and um, flat designs, philosophies. To what degree do you tap into people's sensory and physical understanding of the world and say, we can duplicate that? Uh, and we are talking about files and folders as something that was ultimately physical and had certain limitations and all sorts of problems, but was a good metaphor for certain uses. Um, and the question of, uh, you know, let's just say VR and IR and AR and uh, uh, all of these things is what do you gain and what do you lose by shifting to something which fools the senses more? Um, Makes it easier to stop. Yeah, well, well it, it depends on what you're doing. It, yeah. I mean, the first time I had a, um, a telephone answering machine that, that was really good, it pissed everybody off because they get a message from Ted Selker that sounded like it was Ted Selker. And in fact, it wasn't, and they'd be angry. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of the expectations of the user and also what it does to their sensory. I love the way you said that about the sensory, uh, fooling the sensory system. That is that really what you want to do is, is, is have people have the re appropriate reactions to the things that they're interacting with. There's a question from Edwin Lee. Oh, just to, just, to just to contribute here, um, I've always thought of that as a, a question of, you know, analogous to the question of where is the wisdom lost in knowledge, where is the knowledge lost in representation, and so on. Right? It's 
it's a question of what it is you want to support. Um, maybe it helps to make something look like felt on your desktop, but hopefully that's because of something else besides we like felt. Right. Although there's something we say for, for pure aesthetic design. That's another dimension. But he can't drive it. It's got to be a secondary thing. Hi. Um, I'm kind of new here, so I just wanted to say hi. My name is Rama Hetzlein. I'm a, I did a dual degree in computer science and fine arts at Cornell University. Ah, right. And um, I'm now a professor of interaction design here at um, California College of the Arts. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess my question is a little bit about publication and the direction that LLMs are taking. Um, I've noticed there's kind of an increase, not just in um, HCI, but in computer science, but in lots of fields generally, of more publications and requirements for publications in AI, and also an increased focus on kind of like dialogue systems as a way to interact with machines over possibly other ways of either publishing or interacting with machines. And I'm just curious what your thoughts are about um, how do we maintain this in the era of AI, how do we continue to maintain this kind of positive view that there are many other ways to interact with machines besides just dialogue systems? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's um, the newest, shiniest thing is always the one that gets the attention, right? I mean, so, and there, that's partly because the companies that are doing it are really want that to happen and they, the hype is conscious, but otherwise it's just the public, public mood and spirit and so on. I mean, hey, that's cool. Um, and I think you just have to, step people back and say, what, what, what are you really trying to get done here? Right? Yes, that's cool, right? The cool things are nice, I'm not against cool things, but is it helping or hurting what you wanna get done in this particular use? And so what are your thoughts on, sorry, what are your thoughts on how, how we change the publication space in that? So a lot of journals are kind of like calling for AI and there's a greater emphasis on AI papers in publication. How do we continue to maybe encourage publication that is broader than just that. Talking more about the publication space, not just the public perception. Products or publications too? I, I guess I mean like yeah. um, scientific publication, and research publications. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's a good right. question. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 I mean, the publication world has its own dynamics, power dynamics, Yeah. right? And if the journal feels they're gonna get more readers or whatever their coin of the realm is, money, um, by having more AI articles, it's their interest in doing it, aside from whether it's good for the field or good for whatever. Um, I don't, I think, that, I don't have a good answer except put out good quality stuff that's not that and get people to want that. Hi, I'm Elaine. So I work in design like uh, for AI systems now. And I'm actually curious, when starting the HCI, category at Stanford, why was there a skepticism around that? And how did you kind of turn that around? And I went to Carnegie Mellon for- Ah, for okay, so you're yeah. one of those Carnegie people. So the answer is academia, academia, like lots of other fields, has a sort of hierarchy of respectability. Our department, the Stanford Computer Science Department, actually started in the math department. It did not start in electrical engineering, which a lot like MIT, computer science was from electrical engineering. And there was a very strong uh, underlying feeling that theorems were really important and gadgets weren't, right? <laughs> to put it in overly simple terms. Um, so in that context, there aren't very many good theorems from HCI. You can teach Fitz Law, but that's about all there is, right? Um, so you have to convince people that what's respectable isn't just the logic of mathematical computation, which is great stuff if you do it, um, but is something else having to do with people. And then they say, well, why are you in computer science? Go do sociology or anthropology or one of those fields, psychology. Um, and so it was interesting, it's going back to just my own private, my own personal experience at Stanford, the psychology department at Stanford for many, many years was totally resistant to this kind of stuff because they thought the only thing that was respectable psychology was repeatable lab experiments, right? That made it scientific. And if you tried to talk about people and what they wanted and how they did it, that was not scientific enough. And again, I mean, somebody once said, computer science proves the point that any, any 
field that has to put science into its name isn't one. Hello. <laughs> uh, oh. oh, yeah. Hi, I'm TJ McLeish, uh, Media Lab guy. I teach over design over at Berkeley, like technology stuff. How do we get these kids to think? I'd love to talk to you more about that, but I think I have an opportunity here to ask you about Flores and your time with him. Uh, did you ever have a chance to talk about Cybersyn or Stafford Beer? Or, yes. And how did that, how did that manifest itself and move so, forward? So, I mean, if you're interested, I mean, have you read the Morisov uh, work on that and uh, Eden Eden Medina? So, so I, I, I she sent me an email, Winograd at CS. Um, I can send you some references. There's been a book written about Cybersyn uh, by a woman named Eden Medina and. Uh, Evgeny Morisov, did his, uh, who's a very interesting uh, philosopher of technology, I would call him, I'm not sure how to call him, but uh, did a whole series of um, uh, podcasts on uh, Cybersyn. So it has a very interesting history and cultural embedding. Uh, for those who don't know, it was, a, it was a guy named Stafford Beer, who was a cyberneticist, one of the very few at the time, from England, and he got drawn into the, I mentioned earlier that the Flores was uh, in the state-owned corporations in Chile. And he got connected up, I've, I've read the story, but I've now forgotten the details, with Stafford Beer, and they ended up developing this whole system for managing the economy of, the manufacturing economy of Chile, uh, using old teletypes, which they could connect in networks from factory to factory. Uh, and then um, there was a guy named Guy Bonciep, who was a uh, designer who designed this futuristic, it looks like it's out of Star Trek, uh, control room, um, where all of these information from around the country came in. I think that was more to impress people that it was something important than to actually be a control room, but that's the way we do things. Um, so, uh, the, I mean, the quick answer is it was an interesting experiment and it was completely cut off by the coup. Um, there's a question on, online, and I think I'm gonna stop, stop our questions so that we don't all get sick tomorrow for not getting enough sleep or something. <laughs> um, but somebody asked you, and I know last one time I saw you recently, you said, oh, I'm writing again with, with uh, or meeting again with Fernando. And I, you know, I'm not sure, I mean, at this point, there's no reason to write, to write more books, but, but the question uh, was, if you were to write a book now, what would it be and why? That's a question I get asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it would have to be something in the social consequences of AI, I mean, to, to very broadly mm -hmm. paint it. I mean, not, it's not gonna be a technical book. I'm not doing technical work. Um, and I think the place where there is a lot to be thought about is how do we understand what is going to be done? Um, you know, going back to the Brian Smith quote, right? I mean, how, not, is it going to be smart, but how are we going to use it? Great. And, um, I guess the last thing I want to make sure is that you, um, consider asking, uh, any question of us that you want us to, to think about? That anybody, you know, maybe has some... Uh... What's the answer? <laughs> 47. Yeah. Yeah. I knew somebody would know. See, that, that's why you married her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Well, with that, uh, thank you, everybody, for being a part of this program. And I really appreciate everybody coming. And it's sorry it went a little late with, uh, with the debate, uh, but I think the debate... Uh, uh, was worthy of our attention as well. And um, I uh, welcome you all to come um, to next month's meeting. There are some other places we can, we can use in Palo Alto that we're considering. And uh, I welcome other people's input to that. Uh, please uh, consider volunteering. And uh, let's uh, give a round of applause. For also Ted. thank Ted for pulling us together. <laughs>